Just try and turn that off. Oh, we don't got no noise. Somebody listening to it. Somebody listening to me. Train walking around. We're going live. We're live, Seth. All right, guys. We're going to start. Here we go. Let's go, Seth. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another beautiful day at Honk United. This is the New Orleans Brass Band uh, Music, Culture, and Lifestyle panel. My name is Seth Balin. I play saxophone in the Young Fells Brass Band um, in New Orleans. I've been attending Honk Fest and playing since 2009. Best festival in the world. Um, we are here today to learn a little bit more about the city, New Orleans, our music, uh, uh, from some of the most active members of the, of the scene. So if you're watching live, we encourage you to type some questions for us in the Q&A. Um, is there anything that you want to know? Uh, before we get to those questions, let's first just go around and introduce ourselves. So I'm going to call it a name. Please introduce yourself. Tell us your name, what instrument you play, and what band you play with. All right, so JT, go ahead. My name is JT. I play with the Young Fellas Brass Band. <laughs> and I play the trumpet. Nice. Roy. My name is Roy Lancaster. I play trombone, and I also play with the Young Fellas Brass Band. Thank you. Blake. Blake McCarthy, y'all. The phone is mad. Young Fellas Brass Band, y'all. Amen. Nice. And you also play with uh, Talladega. What do you guys call the Hurricanes? Talladega. Whatever y'all want to call us. All right. That is a You guys don't want to know what I call y'all. Oh, whoosh. It's homecoming week, baby. What it? Pina, introduce yourself yeah. for us. How y'all doing? I'm Thaddeus Ramsey. And I play sousaphone and a bass drum for the Young Fellas Brass Band. Who else do you play with? Man, I play for the whole. <laughs> world, man, man. Big Six. Uh, tell them, tell them who is real, Big man. Six. Six. Rebirth, the Stooges, Hade, the Truth. I play with every band. Tremé. All right. Queen of Brass, anybody. <laughs> Peanut. What you see? <laughs> Brandon, are you there? No, Brandon left. I seen his uh, comment. He left. Okay. Uh, Ed, go ahead and introduce yourself. My name is <laughs> of the original Big Seven, and I'm the founder of the Red Flame Hunters, all you Indian tribe, and I'm the connection for all the young musicians and young people from New Orleans who's, gone to, who's now going to Boston, to, to Somerville for Hulk Festival, I was one of the instrumental first guys from New Orleans with the original Big Seven Brass Band, Thaddeus Ramsey, Troy Jones, uh, Samuel Jack, Sam, uh, John Michael, uh, Mark Shane, I can remember Back it up guys. For me. We, we, we started this with Thaddeus Ramsey and the guys. We started that, Sam. All right, thank you. So yes. people are really interested in um, how a musician comes up in New Orleans. So when and why did you start playing music? And I want to throw that question over to Blake. Uh, let me just unmute you real quick. Hey, can y'all hear me now, sir? Yeah, Brandon, go ahead and introduce yourself. Tell the people what instrument you play, what bands you play with. Hey, all right, my name is Brandon Kelly. I'm the Trump Creation Brass Band. And I also play for a, a, a few other brass bands. And I went to the infamous Miles College, and I'm also the head band director at Schaumburg Elementary in New Orleans. Cool. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about how we came up playing. When and why did you start playing, Blake? Uh, to answer that question, I realized, like you said, it started. I'm the, known that I'm the youngest member out of everyone in this video chat. It started all through middle school for me at Kim McDonough 15 in the French Quarter. The band director was Calvin Harrison. And, and it just started there for me. And it just carried all the way through where I'm at now in college. So it's like basically it started for me in middle school. I can say for the sake of me. And why did you start playing? I mean, it really started because it was a random thought of me just playing the horn. It started really through middle school and it was like 
he wanted he needed someone to play too, but it was like I said, might as well. It was a chance for me to start learning the culture of the brass band, the second line scene, and it started there. Cool. And Roy, how about you, brother? Well, I started probably about, I think I was about 10 years old. My um, uncle, God bless him, was Big Chief Donald Harrison. And growing up, I used to go over there. My grandmother would help him and my aunt sew his suits. And my cousin, Christian Scott, was just starting to play trumpet. He was a few years older than me. And his, uh, he had a twin brother, Kyle, who also used to play drums. And I kind of was in the drums at first. But I believe fast forward about two or three years later, I saw him do a feature with the... Uh, Louisiana Philharmonic for a jazz um, dedication with him and Donald Harrison, uh, Terrence Blanchard, Irvin Mayfield. And when I saw how fast he progressed on the horn, I was like, what? If he could do that, I could do that. And maybe about a month or two later, my grandma bought me my first trumpet. That's how it all started from now. Cool. So, yeah, you have a musical family. Blake, I don't know if you mentioned it, but don't you have some uncles or cousins who are musicians too, famous musicians? Well, my uncle is Anthony the Tuba Fast Lazy, commonly known as uh, the greatest tuba player to walk the city of New Orleans, of course, everyone. You heard me. That's another way. That's another reason why I jumped into my uncle. I believe it. All right. And Thaddeus, tell us about your musical family. Oh, you got to unmute yourself, brother. Unmute yourself. Unmute. Man, it goes back to the first day I was born, man. When I when I first came home, man, the Stooges, the Stooges had just started from uh St. Aug and uh John F. Kennedy. So they was uh at my grandparents' house damn that every day rehearsing. So it just, you know, it started there. Then when I got old enough to go to elementary school, I picked up a trumpet and trombone at the the rain, Vivian Hansberry, and I've just been uh, playing music ever since, man. Cool. Now, some some people had questions that they submitted, and um, one of our friends from the party band asked, like, do we have any tips about if a young player is joining a brass band, a young player coming in, how do you harness that energy? How do you let them uh, be like participate without – muddying up the band if they're not that experienced. Um, and Brandon, since you're a, a, a teacher, you work with kids, can you talk a little bit about how we, how we bring young, young kids in and, like, and show them the brass band culture? Uh, I, I, always, I always start with fundamentals, you know, uh, with the kids. I start with the fundamentals. And, you know, uh, after they get the fundamentals down pat, I give them a reward of learning how to play without a brass band culture because it's actually a good way for you to be able to take care of yourself. You can help your family with bills, you know, and stuff like that. So it's, it's like a, a give and take. You know, I, I give it to them, and it's up to them if they want to take it or not, you know. Yeah. And, um, in New Orleans, most of us started with marching band. Most of us in here, I, I'm probably all us in here, started with marching band. So, Amen. you know, marching band plays a big part of how successful the brass band world is in New Orleans. Yeah. What marching band did you come up in when you were young, Brandon? Well, I started in eighth grade at St. Augustine High School. I played tuba. And then I one day I was messing around on trombone and, and a band director heard me play the trombone and he made me get on trombone so that's how i ended up being a trombone player now nice and jt you were uh in marching band too right yeah i started playing the trumpet in like third grade at mcdonald 15 that was pre-katrina and i've been playing the trumpet ever since then and i ain't started doing this brass band stuff till i after i graduated warren easton i went to warren easton and played in the band for three years over there but then I played in a band for one year, uh, Old Parrot Walker. Okay. And Roy, we know that... JT. <laughs> Sorry, Blake. Go ahead. I was telling JT he refused to tell the world that he marched for Old Parrot Walker. I ain't ashamed of it. 
I marched for the great Rollins. So yeah, that was a great band. Um, how Roy, you leave that out, JT? Roy Roy's a big um brass uh sorry marching band uh just fan and 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 participant. Can you tell us about your marching band experience and what role does marching band play in New Orleans, Roy? And I'll meet yourself. Well, I got a really interesting history when it comes to marching band because I only spent technically one, one year in a real New Orleans marching band. I was a third grade Marshall Middle. After that, I ended up going to private school in Metairie at John Curtis, and I graduated from East Jefferson. But every year I was at those schools, I constantly saw everybody else that was in the marching band in New Orleans across the field. We played every New Orleans public school. So I definitely had a, a different uh, perspective of based of where I was marching to where I started trying to change the style of the schools I was at. But marching band is really important in the city of New Orleans, especially because I spent so much time teaching myself. I was actually assistant band director at Marshall Street two years before Hurricane Katrina even hit. So I was able to see the progression of music from before the storm and after the storm to see how much of an effect it really had on just the kids in the neighborhood and just young, the younger generations. And I can honestly say there were a lot of kids that I saved personally from being on the streets just by having them in a marching band. So it gets to a point where it's, it gets a lot bigger than just being cultural on how important marching band really is. It like builds structure, discipline, like it gives the kids something basically to do after school every day and keeps them out of trouble. And it also gives them a good school, a good skill that they can actually use regardless of whether they decide to carry on with it after they graduate. Yeah, that's cool. And in my experience, marching band also gives kids like chops. You know, they learn how to just play strong and loud. And Brandon, you and I worked at SciTech the past two years in the marching band. And, you know, I just heard kids come up from never having played to their second year, just blasting <clears throat> just super strong high notes. Like, do you really t talk to me about how you get kids to really play strong and out? And oh, and another question is, is do they read music or is it mostly by ear or a mix of both? It's, it's actually a, a mixture of both. Because um, I, 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 I like to have them with the ear training also so they can understand this is an E flat, this is an F, you know? And um, we, we really do both because a lot, of that, a lot of stuff that we really was playing, you know, was, was really on a college level. So I didn't expect them to really read it to 100%, but I expect them to at least know the basics, you know, the half notes, the whole notes quarter notes and eight notes, you know, for middle school, you know. Yeah. So I, I keep it to a male minimum when, I mean, a male, a male minimum when they're reading music. So, you know, so um, as, as side tech, we played a lot of college arrangements, you know, and for those kids to, to just pick up a horn and be able to play like that in his first or second year, it's really amazing. So you work with me, you, you start a progression of those kids that we was actually teaching. And said you really did a good job with the woodwind section because those kids weren't able to, to, to play a note and you had those kids playing everything. Well, I noticed that the, they, they progressed so quickly because we taught mostly by ear and taught a lot of songs and just kept it moving fast. Mm -hmm. And we rehearsed every day, five days a week. Some days five days Saturday. a week. Yeah. yeah, sometimes Saturdays, you know. Um, and and I I re, like I said um I respect I respect every band director in New Orleans because it's really hard and they they really keeping the kids out the street you know we we fighting against crime we fighting against sex we fighting against drugs you know it, it's hard to keep them off the streets like that so I appreciate a, anyone that's dealing with music at all especially all these guys on here they they are all family to me everybody on your family to me. Yeah. Now, speaking of um, of uh, starting music when you're young, I wish Damon was here because uh, he started playing with young fellows when he was really little. And I don't know, JT, were you around when Damon started coming around with the young fellows on snare drum? Actually, that's probably more my error. That was okay. like, I would yeah. say that's like two, 2008, 2009. No, like way after like, 2008, Roy. I was, was tell you. I just got in the band in 2008, 2009. That was like 2012, 2013. No, 
It was that late. I thought it was before. Yes. I, I thought it was real, before the first playing with my band. Because he was playing the, with my band, bro. The the was, was like in 2011, something like that. Yeah, first that sounds about right. 2011 so does sound about right. You said he, he, he came up, started playing your band when he was young? Yeah, because I started a band called The Young Souls, fresh out of high school. Peanut was in that oh, band. I remember that band. <laughs> I remember that Indeed, band. Indeed, man. Oh, it was live, boy. Peanut was in that band with me. We had Peanut, we had Damien, and he was playing snare drum. He was playing snare drum at the time. And then it was like, he was playing snare drum and he started out playing snare drum. But it was like after maybe about six months and he started really watching everybody who played trombone and he liked the way, you know, the trombone sounded. He just picked the horn up and started playing it. And he was just good with it. Now, was it, was he any good on snare drum when he first started coming out? Yeah, and no. Yeah, me personally, I think he better on snare than he is on that trombone. But he's really good on the trombone. Is that, that's saying something. I don't have nothing negative to say about him. That's my boy. So, hey, I, I personally think Damon is real good on trombone to say that he never picked it up a day in his life. Yeah. So, I guess my, the main question I have is, is, uh, when someone wants to learn and they come out and they're a beginner, I've noticed the band is always really welcoming into letting a young, inexperienced player play. Do you have any tips on if other bands do that, bring in inexperienced players, what do you do to make that person feel comfortable, to make them just jump in and be able to play and not be you know, scared and to like progress fast? Does anybody have tips on that? Take yeah. ones that you win. Take money. Put them next to you and tell them go. You go and they go. Yeah. And we, we're gonna we're gonna talk about it at the end of the performance. Yep. And now, then just Ed, walk them through it. I, yeah. I, I need you to perform. Ed, you're you work with youth. So what tips do you have to help break kids out of their shell and to just just go with it? And unmute yourself, please. Uh, just do it. Ed, Basically. you gotta unmute yourself, please. I am Get everyone in the room, you get them all together as a band, and you just start letting them play. Sooner or later, everybody starts to figure out their parts. Before you know it, like Daddy's will tell you, and the rest of the guys, Sam and the guys will tell you, you start figuring out your parts, you start learning the music, you start helping one another learn their parts, and before you know it, you start developing a band one song at a time. May not be a whole lot of songs, but every week, if you work on one song, and you build on that one song, you can build a whole repertoire of music and you can start going on hit the street. But it's so hard to make the street in this town. That's the hardest thing for a lot of bands because they don't get the one opportunity that happens if somebody give them an opportunity to do a parade or do a performance. There's so many good bands out there and so many young men who have went through the struggle of becoming great musicians where they're at. Like that is one of the best bass drum players maybe in the whole state. You know, and not only brass band music, maybe around the country, but he started so young and he had an identity of, I remember Thaddeus was Big Black. You know, Big Black was this band. Yeah, hey, don't do that. Don't do that whole live, boy. No, it's so, going so. all the way around the world. <laughs> they need to know they need to know you was great young, at a real young age. Yeah, tell them oh, I was a rapper. You know, you bring guys and learn from guys, you know, some guys is there for a, a small ride. But like when I had Thaddeus and I had uh, I had uh, Marshane and, and them guys like the Sam, especially Sam, because Sam played everything also like Thaddeus. They could play every instrument so they could teach other band members their parts. So it's important to have people in a band that's very versatile, that can play a lot of stuff that helps it, makes it easier on the band director. Cool. Yeah. You and then up. You got to just tell guys when they don't believe that they're good, you just got to encourage them and tell them keep coming back and don't and try not to let them quit what they're doing. Always have some, even if they sound bad and everybody laugh, you pull them on the side and tell them, man, you go home and practice that some more. I guarantee you're going to hear the lick. They're going to all love you. You know, sometimes we just shy and we just yeah. need the encouragement. So positive reinforcement, support, you know, just getting kids to do it and having someone there to, to, to support. Brandon, we got one more question from uh, for a teacher. So this is for you from uh, Greg in the chat. He says, how do you describe the necessity for playing in an even rhythm to beginner players? So like, 
how do you get kids to know that playing in an even rhythm is important? Does that make sense? Well, first thing I explain it, I explain it like music is is gum is, is basically gumbo. So you know you can't you can't put your 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 gumbo roux in there, and you can't you can't have gumbo without smoke sausage. You know you can't have gumbo without your seasoning. You know everything should come together so it could be one flavor. You know, that's how basically I explained it to the kids so they understand that music is important. It's just like the choir, you know. The choir, you have your sopranos, you have your bass, you have your tenors, you know. So everything should come together in, in, a, in a sound to where the chords blend together, you know, and, and you everybody should listen to each other so nobody is overblowing, you know, and, and stuff like that. It's, 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 it's simple methods to get these kids to understand that, you know, I've been doing it like 12 years. It's like my 12th year being a band already. So, you know, I, I found simple ways to make him understand that it's very important to, to come to practice, first of all. You have to practice. Second of all, you have to want to, you have to want to learn it. If you don't want to learn it, you're not going to learn it. That's with anything in life, period. You know, and and I really appreciate the way these kids really like they, they really like want it. Like they really want it these days. Like um like Blake. Like Blake and JT. I remember when them dudes and Thaddy. I remember when Thaddy was at walk on too. I watched all these young men come up from from youngins and I knew they were gonna be good. And like Roy, Roy used to always tell me, man, Brandon, man, you need to practice. Because I really didn't start doing brass band until I was grown. You know, I was out of college and everything. And Roy used to give me a lot of tips on what to do and how to practice. And, and you know, you got you to gotta know how to practice also. You can't just practice. You have to practice knowing what you're doing at practice so you can understand what's going on when you're playing your instrument. And I can say Roy is probably one of the best trombone players I know. Honestly. So, you know, I took a lot of advice from Roy also. Yeah, let's, I'm going to bring this next one to Roy about kind of about precision. This is a question from Matt in the party band. He says, what's more important in a performance, attitude or precision? Roy, do you got any uh, thoughts on that? Actually, it could kind of, it kind of could go both ways because you could have a band with a great attitude. They may not be the best musically they may not be the best precise when it comes to playing but if they have the energy behind that performance they can really it all depends on interacting with the crowd but you can still also have a band that can play everything perfectly and it may not be as interactive but the musical side of it can also take press you know precedence over that so it kind of it's a hand-to-hand -hand thing i think both of both of those aspects are actually important to really putting on a good show yeah. JT, you have any thoughts on that as another melody player? If what's more important, attitude or precision, or how does that balance work? Uh attitude is precision on some stuff. Like if it oh. makes sense, like you gotta have the mindset to like play it the way it's supposed to be played consistently. Yes. So it's like I don't really know how to explain it. <laughs> Cause it's like you just got to... If you think you're going to mess up, you're going to mess up. I mean, yeah, that too. If you already got it in your head going, it's all good. Yeah, and then it's all about I, repetitiveness. I can help him out with that also, man, because um, precision and attitude, it, it basically go hands in hand. Um, precision mean a lot, you know, and, and attitude, like like when I first started off, like Raw used to tell me, man, like... um. It's not about what it's not about the note that you mess up. It's about the next note that comes out, you know. So it's about like, how you with precision. Yeah, it's about how you recover. It's not about how you fall, it's about how you get up, you know. I like that. And I like Thaddeus what you said about how attitude is like a mindset. It's like confidence. If you have confidence, then you'll play way better than if you're But one thing about stuff. brass band music, there is no right or wrong way. Yes. Now see all that all that perfect on on the note? No. No. That ain't gonna work. Now y'all go back and, and one of my favorite rebirth tapes and those old Olympia tapes. 
and all that, and y'all gonna hear. It's not about being on precision. Yeah. It's a, you know, and, and, and peanut, 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 I, I, I some song be slow, mm-hmm. some song be bad. James Brown always James Brown always said if it sounds good, it feels good, then it's musical. You know? It's good. Well keep going. Yeah, that's great. I mean Thaddeus, that's the other thing. Listen to the rebirth, the Olympia, you know, all the great bands that came before us. Now I have a question about that as far as tradition and taking it to the next level and and also bands being being on versus bands being spontaneous and loose. Ken asked a question about, he often sees bands start out as very improvisational and spontaneous, but once they move up to another level, um, maybe play bigger venues, they sometimes stick to more fixed arrangements, tried and true patterns. And he says, that's partly, I think, because people, when they pay to see you, pay tickets to see you, they can't take as many chances. The band can't take as many chances and they have to put on a great show. So what do you think about that perception as far as when bands get to a certain level, they have to kind of play it safe? Uh, Blake, do you, want to, do you want to say anything about that? And unmute yourself. There you go. Say what you said again. So like, yeah. like bands playing spontaneous and improvised when, they, when they're younger on the street and then when they get to another level, sometimes they play it safe and they play more tr- uh, predictable Patterns, I guess, set, arrange stuff. Sure, in time, but I don't know about spent, you know, because just like I said, ain't no right or wrong way. Yeah. Yeah, right. it, it up, but it's still going to flaw. Believe me. I didn't been to the Maple Leaf a lot of times. Heard, heard a million and one of uh, Rebirth Records. It's never going to be perfect. Right. But some might argue that when it's a little sloppy, it's better because it's more exciting and more improvisation. Yeah, because it, it has that, that that raw and uncut feel. Yeah. It, it's like, I don't know. It's just like when you're a kid and you got to listen to, you know, just like I was saying, how we bring the next person in. A lot of cons- constructive criticism and all that you just gotta you just gotta keep going you can't stop you gotta keep going and with right you keep going you'll get better in time Blake right. what do you think about that it's like the mind you have to set your mind to want to be great and it's like like y'all was saying you have to practice even if you don't you you gotta practice with nobody. Someone you don't need to practice with somebody standing over you. And that's what I try to preach to a lot of young people that's my age. Okay. This get their brand. Like some of the you stuff you might up. play may not be right in the moment. But if you constantly practice, it'll come. It's gonna click eventually. But it may not like Peanut said, it may not be perfect every time. But like you said, you heard me. Each time it'll be something different. Each time, this is the fact that you try something. Say the fact you're in the middle of a song, you just try something. It fits the song, but it's not the actual part to the song, but it fits. That is just you trying things because you're practicing constantly, practicing. You just trying, and that's what makes you you. Exactly. Exactly. All right, Damon's here. Damon, why don't you uh, introduce yourself? Tell us your name, what you play, what band you play with. Thanks for joining us. Yeah. My name is Damon Thomas. I'm a trombone player for Young Fellas Brass Band. And drums also. And drums also. What what other bands do you play with? You play with a lot of bands in the city. Yeah, I play I play with a number of brass bands. Laying Yard Brass Band. I don't play with Brian Murray Brass Band. I picked you up um, from a Kinfolk gig yesterday. Kinfolk, yeah. What Kinfolk. about Big Six, Damon? What Big Six. <laughs> I had a little run with Big Six. <laughs> Um, Cool. So we got a lot of good questions. I'm going to try to cue you into this as well, Damon. Um, A lot of people have questions about, about why there are no women in brass band, not no women, but why is brass band a male dominated scene? And what do you do to support 
girls in in marching bands. Blake, you're raising your hand. Do you have something to say about that? So it's like, like I said, it's a thing you got to want. You have to want to be great. And that's what I still, like I said, I try to preach that to people my age because like knowing that me, I'm probably the youngest one on this panel right now. It's like, you have to want to be great. It's like, you can't make someone, it's like you could get someone to practice with you, but it's like, you're not going to always have someone to stand over you to practice. And it's like, certain things you have to do on your own for you to realize I don't need no one over me to make me do it. Right, but My is that, cool. is that a, a male thing? Or like, to me, that seems like any, any woman it's should a, be it's great, want to be great. Male, it's a mental thing you should want as a musician. It's like, it's, right. it's not a male thing. Cause I seen a lot, I, I seen a, brass, a, a female brass band with females that were my age, they came around like a couple years ago, but they stopped doing it. Cause like everyone had their own interests and things they wanted to do. So it's like, in order for you to really do that, you gotta really want to want it. You gotta want it. At the end of the day, you have to want it. Yeah. It's like and that, <laughs> that transcends gender. Like anybody can, can want it. Yes. Want it. So, Brandon, how, how do you how do you support the women in, in marching bands, and and get them to be interested in music in general and brass band music? Well, the way I the way I get it, man, is um, I, I explain to them that this could be this could be a life changing moment for them. You know, once they put that horn in their hand, it, it could change their life completely. You know, because you could go to college and play in the band, get a full scholarship in college, but you don't have to major in music. You can major in whatever you want, you know, and you can also make money for your household. You know, you, especially by the, the young people, I wish I would have, I wish I would have been playing brass band music when I was 14, 15 years old, you know, no, cause. You no, you don't. Yeah. I, no. And why you say I don't? No, no. That say, let take that from me. That is, you going backwards. Even Tell though you don't peanut. have to, you don't have to major in music, but just playing brass band music in New Orleans and then going to college, epic fail. No, I think that was no. I'm not. I'm not saying. Look, I'm not saying that you that you have to um that you have to do both. I'm just letting you know, like you you can go either path. Like, if you want to do brass band, that's cool because I don't see a lot of people travel the world. Pete, now you you travel a lot with that brass band music. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Like, and you got some people. You got some people that want that want other careers. Like, I'm what I'm basically saying is you you could march for college, but you don't have to major in music. But you could go to school for free, and and right. do whatever you want to do. Right. You know, dreams dreams come true. You feel? That's all I'm saying. Uh, but I'm just saying, like, I don't know. I believe our music caliber scale is different from, you know, collegiate music caliber scale and everything. I mean, look at look at Blake. Look at Blake. Blake, Blake go to college right now, but Blake is doing both. You know, Blake doing both. And, and I, I see that Blake is successful with doing both. Blake, what you majoring in in college, Blake? Blake, music Blake. education major, of course. Blake, Blake what's he's that great, here, man. And Blake, See, what's, the, what's the percentage of female to male in the marching band right now? Do you know roughly? I mean, there's a lot of females that are really interested into band, but it's like mainly people they don't want to try the the main dominant instruments or the voicing instruments of the band. They mainly Trying woodwinds, drums, and you have your little few, your few guys who on tuba, trombone, baritone, French horn, or mellophone, whatever you want to call it. It's just like you got your ones who really want it and who really don't. And so, why do you think that if there's a high percentage of women in the in the in the marching band, there's a very low percent of women in in the brass band scene? See, that's the the way that's set up is like you can really tell New Orleans kids, New Orleans young musicians are thrown into brass, man. Sometimes are thrown into it to where it's up in other places like maybe you'll say 
Florida, North Carolina, or Tennessee, you don't have, they don't have what we have in New Orleans. It's like mm-hmm. our culture is real unique. And like by me, me being up here, a lot of people that I go to school with here at Talladega, they look at me crazy because like I really walk around campus really listening to brass band all day and people look at me crazy like why you listen to that and I tell them it's just for the betterment of myself the more fully understand my heart other than just marching band concert band jazz bands like there's many different genres of band and it's like you really have if you want to be that that hell of a musician you really have to look in other genres of band expand your horizon exactly yeah now Ed I wonder since you're in the in the Mardi Gras Indian tradition and the social clubs. And by the way, if you haven't seen the video on the Red Flame Hunters, it aired on Honk United Day 2. Check that out. There's a great piece on Ed's organization. Ed, what's the ratio like of women to men in the Mardi Gras Indian tradition? And is that has that been changing over the years? Could you speak on that? And go ahead and unmute yourself first. We have a lot of women in the, Mardi, in the Black Masked Indian scene, we have a lot of women. But I want to get back to why not a lot of women are on the street playing the music during the, uh, the parades, the second line parades. Yeah. People don't tell you that playing, being a musician to play a second line parade is very physical. It's very physical, not only on your body, but on your lips, because you get a lot of bust lips from people that's out there dancing, running into your horn. A lot of times the women ain't going to take all of those bust lips are beat up, being beat up with the crowd and stuff like that. So that changes a lot of them off the top because people don't never tell you about to be a brass band member playing parades here in New Orleans. You have to be physical. You have to be prepared and you definitely have to be well. You got to be trained for that. It's not, it don't happen overnight. You need a couple of parades to get your body in, in a physical condition. So a lot of women, they, they love to play they just don't want to take that whipping. You know, like when you see the, the pinettes, them girls, are, they, 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 they do a lot of stage performances, but they don't do a lot of parades where there may be two or three or 4,000 people out there like what the other guys do and Blake and Daddies and them guys are doing where the crowd is wall to wall, everybody's pushing you. It's very physical out there. And for the Mountain Indian culture, we have a lot of women that participate and we have a great line of great big queens of New Orleans that has participated in the Mardi Gras Indian culture. So a lot of women participate in that culture, some not up front, but a lot of women behind the scenes helping gentlemen and ladies. So a lot of families have a lot of women back there helping out. Yeah. I mean, it is very physical playing second line music, especially those four hour second lines. And it's really loud and it can be taxing. There was a question in the Q&A that somebody had about, do you wear earplugs when you play? And personally, I've never seen earplugs in the brass band world. If, but no. if anybody wears them, let me know. I put headphones on for fashion, man. That don't be me listening to other music. <laughs> I be having billions of people come run up to me after the show. Hey, man, what you listen to? How you listen to three songs at one time? I'm like, Y'all is really crazy. <laughs> you put earbuds. You put earbuds in your ears during a second line. No, it don't. It don't be earbuds. It 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 just be uh regular headphones, but don't nothing be playing. Yeah, look, wait, wait. It just wait. be like for fashion though. <laughs> I caught them. Wait, I caught Peanut doing this a couple times. I it just be for fashion. I don't be listening to nothing. I can't even tell you if my phone <laughs> ring and my phone be plugged up. <laughs> so yeah it's, it's my understanding that nobody wears earplugs and we want to get the full loudness of the band is that right yes you want to hear and feel everything you won't feel the yeah. bad notes you won't feel the vibe from from the people that you plan for you won't feel the vibe right. of the people that you standing next to now does anybody have older relatives or friends that talk about like hearing damage? Has anybody gone deaf? Do they have tinnitus or there's like that ringing? Anybody know about that or? Nah, I ain't gonna lie. Nah, I ain't gonna lie. At certain points, you do go a little bit deaf because it's like certain stuff you ain't gonna be able to hear because you know you used to hearing everything so loud or whatever. But nah, you don't really go deaf. Yeah. Yeah, hey, you, you don't go. You don't go fully deaf. 
pounding the tube in your ear. So, you know, you're going to have a little moment. You're going to for a little while, but you're going to come back. It's gonna be yeah, it's going to come back. Peanut. Better than ever. A little ring in the back of my head. That's what I call it. <laughs> Blake, <laughs> Peanut. Oh, yeah. And Blake. They always doing that in my ear. Well done, bro. Oh, yeah. So, Damon, if you're standing right in front of the tuba, tell me about that. You, you've told me once that you like the sound of really loud eardrum being tickled. Yeah. Is that right? <laughs> no. <laughs> Dude. No? No. No. Are you, Damon, are you worried about your hearing? Huh? Are you worried about your hearing? No. Cool. Just keep I'm really, I'm a, you won't mind a good a little bit. I hear everything. You do hear everything. All right. <laughs> We're going to move on. There's a couple questions about um, New Orleans pre and post Katrina. That seems to be a huge landmark in the culture in the city where the city drastically changed. A lot of musicians, local homegrown musicians moved away and couldn't come back after the storm. And the culture started changing. It started becoming more gentrified. Um, how did the brass band scene change after Katrina? And I don't know, Ed or Roy or Brandon or the older cats. Maybe. I'm going I'm 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 to do this one. It was just like, you know, a lot of, a lot of younger cats, you know, like before Katrina, we had mostly the Reaper on the street, the Heidi and the Stooges. Now, after Katrina, they had this uh, band called uh, Free Agents. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was like uh, musicians from the Stooges and other different bands. But, you know, it just, I don't know. Just like you see the energy and, uh, you know, energy and everything, it just, it's just not there. And like, I don't know. I want to say it's getting passed down, it's evolving, but you know, it's just not what what we was getting before Katrina. If that, if that, if y'all understand what I'm saying. So the energy is just a little different. Yeah, the energy is way different, man. Way. Does anybody yeah. have like specific examples of that? Oh, the tempo changes, the groove changes. And, you know, once the tempo changes and the groove changes, the mood changes. So, you know, you know, we break, like to play damn near every fucking thing fast. Yep. And then it's like, even <laughs> the way you get into this, it changes. Because, <laughs> shit, I remember when I first started out and I was trying to get, in, trying to get into the play of things and I would play and not get paid. And they'll tell me, boy, you better go better go home and do your homework. Better go home and learn some more music. Better practice if you want to get paid out here. Hey, it normally, it normally go like that, man. That's that's what happened to me, JT. You know, I, I used to always just go play my horn just to learn. You know, I ain't even worried about the money. You feel yeah, me? I, so, think just, I feel you. But I, I think it's just the, the, the style of brass band is kind of like, I guess for lack of better phrase, I guess it did evolve from before the storm to after. Cause like before the storm, you know, you had every band had kind of specific their own style, and it was kind of like a different funk groove. Like the Rebirth had their groove, the how they had theirs. Right, Even Soul right. Rebels kind of had their style. But like after Katrina, it's like there's a lot more hip hop and like bounce and other parts of New Orleans music that are getting mixed into it. So those like the entire style of the style of how a band even play has changed. Like bands like TBC, even the Stooges for what they did after the storm. And like now you got bands like Big Six, they have a whole different style of brass band. That's a different energy. Oh, different style. Yeah. So but we all come from, you know, a band in a pre <laughs> you know. Right. But like you gotta think about it. You gotta look at how brass <laughs> band is evolved, period. Because you had yeah. the traditional bands and like the twenties and thirties before the traditional band. bands. Now you got your bounce you got, bands. <laughs> yeah. But but you see how they got, um, you had a different style, like the style of this evolved period from trad, then all the way to to the Dirty Dozen and the Rebirth, how they changed the style up. And then now you got the, the TBC. The but I kind of blame myself for that because I kind of changed the beat, you know, so I take blame on that. Well, speaking about that, about tradition and and creating new styles, like 
what's the balance like between tradition and progression in New Orleans? Like how much do you want to honor tradition, what came before you, and how much do you want to be creating something new? Man, well, I, think that, I believe I think that. it, you know, like it is half and half. <laughs> yeah. Roy, what do you think? We don't have to wear we don't have to wear black and white, but we can still have a second line on Sunday. You feel what I'm saying? Right. Like give and take. I think Peanut kind of I think Peanut has a really good point with that. It is hand in hand. Cause even if you look at how the brass bands are set up, they still set up the same way. You got a back row, you got a front row. Well, no, no, the band's not set up the same because I didn't see some some things where the sousaphones were in the front. <laughs> so and then the bass drum was all the way at the back. So you yeah, know, we're not gonna talk about those bands, all right. But what I say about what I say, <laughs> but what I say about that, fellas, I say you follow your own vision, you know, follow your band vision and yeah. do it up because like like do, big do six. Best for y'all, whatever works yeah, because like like everybody, everybody used to sit there and talk about Big Six playing all that radio stuff, but it works for them and it works yeah. real good for them. I'll say right. this is like you I know do this what works for you. I see a lot of bands they'll drop like a, a mixtape with straight radio songs, and then later on down the line, they'll release the album with straight original music. And it's like you grab your, your crowd by giving them this just to give them this. Yeah, that's what I seen. Right, yeah. that's 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 working. That's working. To me, New Orleans bands have like a strong sense of what the tradition is, and maybe that's just like built in. Like maybe you don't even really think about it that much, but I do notice people, you know, paying attention to the bands that came came before us. How important is it to you guys that you listen to Rebirth, New Birth, Olympia, you know, the old some of the old bands, and incorporate that into your playing? It's important oh, because that's the outline. That's the foundation. Yeah, that's like the foundation. Right. That's like we, num rule number one. Never forget. Huh, Rod? Never forget. That's, that's concert band clinic right there, man. That's the first thing you're supposed to learn. Like, that's how you even structure how a band, at least the concept of which your band should start with, how they should be. Like, yeah. New Orleans brass band has a different style just from any other style in the world. You got a lot of brass bands that emulate us. But yeah, and we be having it's drum it's sets and go go beats and all that yeah. going on. And it's not all of that. Like sometimes it's just a simple straight beat or a three beat or a traditional beat. Like it's, it's certain grooves that fit to hey, it's a groove. our particular style of brass band. And if you don't have that, you ain't got it. For lack like of better phrase, and that's what it is. is you you got to start there. You got to start to mean the thing if you ain't got that swing. You ain't got that swing. <laughs> all right, check the. Check the Q&A. Somebody had a question for you. Okay. Let's check that out. JT, while we get to that, how is it important? How important is tradition to you? I'm, how important the tradition is to me? Yeah. Knowing what came before you. Oh, what came before me? Mm -hmm. Oh, I mean, like, it's important because, like, like I said, it's the, it's the layout of what it's supposed to sound like how it's supposed to go and, you know, just give you the general idea of what it all sounds like coming together. And it's like, when you first starting out, it's like, it's basically like swimming. You know what I mean? You can't just jump in the pool and think you about to just swim. Now nah, you gotta have somebody that's gonna show you, show the strokes. You gotta show, have somebody that's gonna show you the fun. And that's what that is. That's what the traditional music is to us. Cause it's like you per you first picking up the horn, like, you first picking up your horn or your drum, and you just trying to jump out there. They gonna look at you like, boy, what is you doing? Yeah. Can anybody, can anybody, he's on you. Can anybody suggest um, <laughs> recordings that if, if 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 a brass band person from wherever Nebraska is listening in, tell them a recording to listen to that would give them a solid understanding foundation of brass band music. Can anybody just share one good recording they know? <laughs> it depends uh, on it not it depends on what band. Are, are we talk are we talking traditional? Give them so, the yeah, yeah, right. Traditional, traditional or or more modern, doesn't matter. Well, well I'll tell them I, Treme, go ahead. For traditional, I'll tell them look up Treme Brass Band or like even some of those older yeah. Olympia brass bands. Look up Treme Dirty Money Dust. Back. Yep. And I was just thinking about the old bass drum groove to the new bass drum groove. And rest so in Treme, peace, over 
Treme, Olympia, Dirty Dozen. Who else? Until you go listen yeah, to Big Stick and I made my own song, Go Down. Some of y'all might know it as the Popeye song, but yeah, you know, <laughs> it's the same. And obviously, it's the like- same. I just used the, <laughs> I just used the platform that they gave me and I just built my own, own on top of that foundation. Yeah. yeah. So, guys, we have 10 minutes left. Uh, I want to get to a couple more things. People have been really asking more about like pre and post Katrina evolution of sound someone was asking is it causation or correlation that the styles change over the past 15 years and so maybe we can kind of dig into some of the external factors chain of, of the culture changing like someone asked this okay. question could someone talk a little bit about the challenges of development and gentrification in new orleans how that has impacted their street performance and your ability to play in public places so has the fact that new businesses are coming in, more white out of town people coming in, is that changing your ability to play on the street? Is it changing the energy of the city? Anybody yes. On that? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yes. 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 Okay, so everybody yes. Roy, why don't you go first? Well, first off, with these a lot of these new businesses and I, this word, tra the transplants that have moved into the city, they come here with the concept of how they think life is, where they're from, and they try to bring that little piece with them, not realizing that, oh, I they, they come down to Bourbon Street or French, I'm like, oh my God, I just love it. They're always partying. I want to move here. I'm going to come stay right here in the middle of all this. And then they move there, and they're like, oh my God, it's 9 o'clock at night, 10 o'clock at night, 11 o'clock at night. I have work in the morning. I need to get to sleep. There's something I need to do to change that. So I'm going to go ahead and call the police to stop any loud music that's outside my door, regardless of someone with a boom box or for somebody else, there's a band playing on the corner, like any type of loud music, any type of disturbance to them. And I think it's more the idea of they try to come here and they're trying to change it, even though it's, even though the way they changed it, changing it from what they fell in love with when they first came here. And that's like a really big problem is they come here and they feel like, they, you know, New Orleans is, is not broken, but they get here and they're like, oh, now I see the city for what it really is. Like, I can't, you know, sustain like this. I need to kind of have it a little bit calmer. You know, I need to have it closer to home, how things were, you know, that type of deal. Yeah. Anybody else want to talk about that? Yeah, because I, I remember, you know, um, when, when, when the brass bands used to be able to play on, on, on Canal and Bourbon and, and Frenchman Street till whenever they felt like going home. You know, and, and now they got noise ordinance and all this and that. New Orleans never had a noise ordinance ever. Now we have a noise ordinance and, and people calling police on people, you know. Some of the brass band members getting into it with these people. And stuff like that. Yeah. With me because, man, man, set that's just like that's just like what we deal with on Frenchman, man, with uh with Ruben and uh your boy, what's his name? The other yeah. one that from the bookstore. Yeah. Yeah, knowing that they ain't from around, they ain't from here, and that you know, they don't even want us to do what we normally do and what we use and what we used to do. Cause before they even came about, that's what we always did, and that's was that was the spot before that dog was built up. It used to be on the other side of the corner because that other side used to be a big lot or whatever. So we used to play on that corner. Then they built that dog up. Then we moved to the other corner. And for the longest, that little corner spot was closed. And and the the guy Ruben, you know how he did it. He just did it on some on some spiteful stuff. Like, oh, I'm really gonna get these guys out of here. Try to get these guys off this corner. Yeah. Yeah. And about that. The crazy part is then they, they call the police and then the police send a new guy down here. You're right. Guys who's not even who not even from New Orleans, uh, you know, even know anything about our culture, anything. That that would be the most craziest part. I guess that's how the stuff happened with uh, Eugene and all that on Frenchman. Yeah. And then it's a, and then then sometimes they actually be getting paid under the table. Under the table. They get paid under the table just to come fuck with us. Hmm. It seems like in New Orleans, there's a there's an unspoken rule that's that's um, do what you wanna and sort of if you're not bothering me, I'm not gonna bother you. Um, which yeah, the rebirth wrote the whole song about that. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so someone just posted, it's not a question, but she said that she's a, she's a European woman in her twenties and she was lucky enough to spend a lot of time here and found that local bands are extremely welcoming and much more than transplant bands who are often kind of vibey. And I've noticed the same thing that if I go to sit in with any, any band made of locals, like you guys, it's super welcoming. It's always, yeah, come, come play. We'll teach you some stuff, but not in an overt type of like, I'm better than you way more of a, you're welcome here. Let's make music. Let's, let's have fun. Um, and I just think I wanted to mention that because I agree. I think that new Orleans bands are very welcoming, very inclusive. And I, we just wish the city government and police could also have that same type of attitude. And said, when I tell you, when I first, when I first got in, man, when I tell you everybody on here, welcome me with open arms. I'm talking about, you know, like Roy and up, man, all them dudes, Big Sam, Sam, all them dudes welcome me with open arms. Hey, yeah, you can come play with us. You know, it was never a problem, you know, and it, 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 it'll never be a problem because, like you just said, we, we welcome people with open arms. Yeah, you know, because, it's, it's because it's like, whether if we know you, if we don't, you know, it's like, that's a chance. It's just giving you a chance, you know, to yeah, you gonna, jump. You, you're going to be something. Yeah. I might need you. I might need you. So, guys, we have like three, four minutes left. Uh, we didn't get to answer all the questions. Thank you for typing them in, guys. Um, I just want to throw one more thing around there before we have to wrap up. We have to stop at the hour sharp. So, really quick, if you can, I know this is a long question, but in 20, 30 seconds, what does brass band music mean to you? Anything that comes to your mind, we're just gonna go down the list before we leave, sign off. JT, what does brass band music mean to you? Uh, what it means to me is a, it's a life changer. It was a life changer because when I got out of high school, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. And then I still wanted to play my horn and then I just, it just stumbled upon me. I didn't even come across it, it stumbled upon me and it was like, a match made in heaven ever since. And it's like, ever since I started doing this, I've been, I've been all right. You know what I'm saying? Like I've yeah. been able to take care of my business. I've been able to, you know, go buy myself a car and go look for, an, go look for an apartment and stuff like that. Like, mm -hmm. Thank you. Roy, what does brass band music mean to you? Pretty much it's, it's like the heartbeat of the city. Like even from the origins of it, of where it started in New Orleans from the Civil War, when the, the soldiers didn't have anything but their instruments and they used to create trad, traditional music off of marches, off of Sousa marches and create trash from there. And then just how the brass band scene just brings people together. It brings everybody together all over the city. You can be from uptown, downtown, East Bank, West Bank. They got a band playing somewhere and they got a second line going. Everybody's there. So it's kind of like it really brings families together. You know, you meet new friends, you see old friends again, you know, reunions, all that type of deal. It really has a huge part of making sure that people you haven't seen in years, kind of keeping connections with everybody you might've grew up with, you know, thing, people you haven't seen in ages, or people you might've saw like last week, or, you know, people you just met that day, you know, it just, it, it brings the city closer. It gives people- It more might be your last time closer. seeing that person at that event. Exactly, at that event. That didn't happen too many times. Yeah. We already know Peanut, so yeah, it's important to us. That's how you keep New Orleans a family. That's yep. how important Brad's band is. Guys, we got a minute and a half left. Um, Blake, what does New Orleans music mean to you? Make it quick if you can. To add on to what Roy says, like it gel, it brings everybody together. You could either be you could be going through the toughest time in life, but it's like once you hear that band playing, it's gonna bring it out you. It's gonna bring some emotion, or it's gonna bring some happiness out you. And it's like, like Roy said, you're gonna see somebody you ain't seen in a minute, or you like you're gonna make new friends. I met, I was young coming into the Bradsman scene. I met Roy, Peanut, B. You heard me. You say I was young, and like, yeah, I learned a lot through the Bradsman stuff. It taught it taught me how to time manage stuff, time manage, and be responsible for yourself, and knowing how to really handle things for yourself at a grown, mature mind, like how to yeah. really right. Guys, we got 15 more seconds. Thank you so much for joining us. Ed Buckner, take us out. What does brass band music mean to you? Oh, you got to unmute yourself, my friend. <laughs> oh, man. There you go. And family. It means community because it brings back the whole community and it builds the family reunion type of relationship. 
So every Sunday is a family reunion gathering. All of those folks that you haven't seen in your community, maybe in the last year, you get to see all those people and some old. And so people from all around the city of New Orleans get to join each other every Sunday. Beautiful. It's family, it's life, it's community, it's music. Thank you guys so much for joining us. We have to stop. Uh, thank you, Honk. Honk United, you're the best. Honk Fest. Long live Honk. Uh, we'll see everybody next time. All right, y'all take care. Love y'all, boys, bro. Love y'all.